Christian Men's Ministry is an interdenominational men's ministry whose vision is to disciple men using biblical truths and principles. One of our goals is to create a network of men who can coach and mentor each other to fulfill our mandates as priests in our household, godly leaders and servants in, the, in our churches and, market, and workplaces. We discuss our experiences within our homes or the marketplace, and we apply the unchanging truths from the Bible to challenge and hold each other accountable. For all men who would like to stay in touch with the ministry, as well as keep up to date with announcements and events, I will be posting the link to our WhatsApp group in the chat section. I'll also be sharing the link to our YouTube channel for all of those who would like to listen to sermons by our previous speakers. I will now go ahead and open our session in prayer. Thank you, Father God, for allowing us, Father God, to gather, Father God, before you, Father God, on this platform, Father God, this ministry, Father God, that you've created, Father God, that men, Father God, might come together, Father God, that we might be able to receive light, Father God, pertaining our circumstances and situations, Father God. Lord, your word says, Father God, that you are the light of the world, Father God. And we thank you, Father God, that even as we come to you, Jesus, that we receive the light, we receive the wisdom, Father God, that might speak to our situations, Father God. Lord, I pray for all the men, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you might meet them at their points of need, Father God, this morning, Father God. Those, Father God, that we know, those that we do not know, Father God. And we thank you, Father God, for this platform, Father God, where brothers, Father God, might be able, Father God, to comfort one another, Father God, that we might receive light, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So um, just to go over the format of the meeting, so uh, the speaker will speak for the allocated time, after which we will go into questions and answering. Um, I also ask that whilst the speaker is speaking, that you make sure that your videos are off and that you're on mute. I will now introduce our speaker. So this morning we have Mr. Wazara, um, who has been married to Mrs. Rukudzo Wazara for 32 years, and they share a life uh, blessed with six children and the joy of grandchildren. As an accomplished entrepreneur, Mr. Wazara, Mr. Wazara's journey spans extensive experience navigating both small and large markets across Africa. Leading at the highest echelons, Mr. Wazara has served as both CEO, steering businesses in telecoms, media, and health. With a remarkable 15-year dedication, he has played a pivotal role in building mobile networks from inception planning, negotiating licenses, and overseeing the launch and management of satellite networks across nations like Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Kenya, Burundi, Lesotho, and even as far as New Zealand. As founder and CEO of Spiritage Group, he provides advisory services with a global perspective. His deep understanding of African business dynamics, political, regulatory, financial, and market entry nuances defines the group's unique approach. So um, at that point, I can hand over to you, Rainmaker. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Farai. And it's good to see you again. I had the opportunity to meet Farai and his wife uh, last time I was in the UK, and it was such a pleasure. Uh, God bless you. And good morning uh, to um, uh, members of this group. I'm very excited. Uh, to be speaking here this this morning, um, but also being thankful to uh, the leaders of the group who have really uh, taken the values and objectives of this group to a new level and uh, creating an impact uh, within the marketplace. Um, you know, many years ago, uh, in um, 2003, I felt a very strong edge to see how uh, the gospel could be brought into the marketplace. Um, and, you know, I, I just had this very strong sense, you know, as I prayed, as in I interacted with, um, uh, with other people, that the gospel itself uh, a needed to go into the marketplace in a way that was unique, uh, in a way where uh, businessmen that are 
you know, currently, you know, that we find in churches and businessmen that may not come to churches uh, needed to uh, play some role within the marketplace. Uh, and of course, as I looked further, as I, uh, you know, read the Bible further, I realized that, you know, the approach of the Lord Jesus himself uh, had been that, you know, he was taking people from the marketplace to expand the kingdom of God. Um, and so in 2003, we um, started uh, in my home, I think we were 14 guys praying every single day for, 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 um, for almost a year. And we started what we refer to today as apostles in the marketplace. It's a big ministry in Nigeria uh, and uh, in different parts of the, the world is beginning to, to extend to different parts of the world. I think, you know, uh, they talk about a membership uh, of now of between eight and uh, 12,000 business people. Uh, and it's having an impact in the marketplace. And um, then when I came to South Africa, you know, uh, we, we started the same. It was a small group of guys. Uh, initially, we were meeting in hotels, then we started meeting in our homes. Uh, and um, then, you know, Brother Sam uh, took over. And today, here we are, the fruit of, you know, uh, quite a lot of work that has been done by different, you know, people to, to, to ensure that, you know, uh, things are happening within the marketplace. Today, I just want to emphasize a couple of other things. And of course, I, I just wanted to mention that um, in the past year or two, I think uh, Brother Chada wanted us to have another small group where there'd be 10 to 15 guys you know, where we just meet and discuss on a regular basis um, about the things of the, of, of, of the kingdom and how to, to really link the word of God, how to make the word of God practical in what we do. Uh, and there's another group called the Forum, uh, which has got about 100 members. And it's just exciting to see men come together, to see communities come together, to see families come together. Uh, you know, and not just restrict ourselves to, you know, the work, you know, the work that we do uh, for uh, ourselves or the work that we do in our churches, but to see how the church and our lives actually interact. Uh, and, and that's the exciting part of uh, this whole ministry. Today, um, I was... Um, you know, I, I felt strongly to just go over, you know, some of those things that um, I, I believe are very important if we are going to continue to see the expansion of the Word of God, but in a relevant fashion, where the Word of God is present in, in our workplaces, is present in our families, is present in um, our communities and nations. And that whatever we are doing, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, helps because we are an individual. You, you you don't get divided into five or ten different uh, pieces of person. You're just one individual. And how do we create a seamless interface between who we are? How do we transfer who we are into what we do on a daily basis? I notice here that I can't share screen. It's saying you must grant permissions in order to share your screen. Or is it permission that I grant myself? Uh, can the host uh, grant me permission to present? Uh, it should be on your machine. Um, but you can send the slides to us and then we can project on your behalf. But it should be your machine that's oh. asking for permission. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I didn't realize. Um, does anyone have a quick way of me doing it if I needed to do that? I need to go to Safari settings. Uh, you're using a MacBook, right? Mac, yes. Uh, so you need to go to preferences. 
settings, oh. uh, settings and the preferences. Okay, my apologies, uh, gentlemen. Um, okay, so um, system preferences. So um, our, our topic uh, today is really talking about, um, you know, sh shifting existing uh, paradigms uh, using marketplace ministry. I felt very strongly that it was important to um, address the issue of paradigms that we face in the marketplace because um, uh, unless we deal with that, there are so many things that, uh, you know, with all of us coming from different ministries, coming from different backgrounds in terms of our a, you know, a relationship with God in terms of our approach towards, um, you know, the, the faith that we uh, uh, profess. Uh, we're facing the same kind of market situation, the same scenarios, but our approach must enable us to at least address certain paradigms that are there within the marketplace and, and be able to effectively represent the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, many years ago, I went to a conference. Uh, I think it was the God's Not Dead conference. And, you know, I was asked to do a presentation as a business person, you know, um, the section under business. And I prepared quite uh, strongly. You know, I was, you know, quite excited about uh, the presentation. I was going to talk about business. I was going to talk about a lot of the things that I've seen you know, um, in my uh, many years working across Africa. Um, and on the plane, I heard a very clear, I was dozing off and I heard a clear voice that said to me, the marketplace is not about business. And that, you know, I, I, I was actually startled. And I thought, well, I'm going to talk about the marketplace and I'm going to talk about business. Uh, and, you know, I knew it was the Holy Spirit speaking and says the marketplace is not about business. Um, and, um, you know, the voice did not say the marketplace is not just about business. It says the marketplace is not about business. So it was quite a strong statement. And it bothered me until I got to the place uh, where we were staying and I did the present, you know, I did the preparations and went for the presentation. And, you know, um, as it unfolded, as, 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 you know, things started going through, I then realized that that statement is very true. Um, the marketplace, when we look at the marketplace, the marketplace is a, a, a very, very complex place. Um, you know, when you look at the operating environment, there are so many things that are taking place at one go. You know, you've got internet, you've got technologies and their impact, you've got globalization, you've got religions, different types of religions, and we know what has been happening in the, in the globe right now because of religions. You know, you look at, you know, political populism, we have seen, you know, Trumpism, we have seen Putinism, we have seen different types of... Um, a, you know, you know, uh, uh, impacts from pop political populism. Uh, today, the Mis Middle East is ablaze because, again, of um, religious and political populism that is taking place in that area. We've got geopolitical wars taking place. We've got uh, recessions, exchange rates. Economists are talking about different things at any point in time. Uh, you know. Um, this is what is happening in the marketplace. Yet at the same time, this is where we see education, we see life. Everyone is participating in the marketplace. So how do you tackle the marketplace? How do you survive in the marketplace? How do you influence the marketplace? And, and that is part of the um, a, you know, power of um, you know, you know, what we do as believers. And I believe that today, um, uh, the Lord would have us 
go out into the marketplace and change it and influence it, just like he did. When you look at the uh, children of, of, um, of Israel, when the Lord Jesus Christ came in, when they heard that the Messiah you know, was coming through, their vision of the Messiah was very different from what our understanding right, is right now. They were a nation that was, uh, you know, suffering many things. You know, for instance, the Romans had taken over. The Romans were in charge of, um, you know, of, of, of that whole place. I mean, they covered, the Roman Empire was very huge. The Romans believed in absolute power. You could not do what you wanted within the Roman Catholic, within the Roman Empire. You, you, you had to follow the rules. They wanted absolute loyalty. And that's where they introduced all these things, you know, like crucifixions, etc., to make sure that there was loyalty. And of course, they worked with allies on the local environment. So in, 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 in uh, Israel, for instance, they, um, you know, they partnered with the Pharisees who were part of uh, those structures. You know, the Romans did not want to disturb what these guys were doing, and the Pharisees also did not want, you know, to antagonize the Romans. Uh, but people did not like Roman rule. So they expected that there would be this Messiah who would come, a physical guy who would take over, you know, um, you know drive out the Romans, you know, straighten out, you know, the, the religious and political structures in um, and in and, and Israel, and ensure that you know the people of of Israel lived in freedom, and and you know and happiness, and so when the Lord Jesus Christ came in, uh, it didn't quite fit what they what 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 they expected. It didn't quite uh, uh, you know address what they felt the Messiah should be should be doing for them, and and this is this is part of why. I just want to touch on a, a number of things and see how Jesus addressed those things. So I spoke about what the market, you know, the, the, the marketplace looks like and all the different events and dynamics and things that take place in the marketplace. But there are three uh, core issues that I also want to touch on that have shaped, um, you know, the marketplace. First and foremost, the one thing that continues to shape what happens in the marketplace is ideas. I think there's a slight written ideas there. Ideas. You know, uh, ideas, uh, you know, are so, so powerful. They're, they're not physical, they do not take up any space, yet they are real. Uh, there's no power to generate good and evil. They have the power to generate good and evil. And it is important for us to, you know, to consider, especially in this day and age. You can see, you know, anyone can come up with an idea, put it on the internet, and they, they start, you know, uh, creating narratives. Narratives that have got, um, a, you know, that, that will change the world. When somebody said, you know, well, Gender. Who said that there are there's only there are only you know two gender definitions? No, no, no. It can't be two. There's got to be more. And and you know those were ideas that came through, and those are ideas that we've got to deal with. Those are ideas that are impacting the way we operate, the way our children operate, the way our generations coming after us will will, will operate. That's the power of ideas. So, but but those are negative ideas. Um, you know, uh, you've got, you know, in the geopolitics, what they call the axis of evil. Uh, you, you know, when you look at those guys, you know, the rest of the world says, you know, these are terrorists. Uh, on their side, they say, oh, we, but we are freedom fighters. So, so, but those are ideas. It's a clash of ideas. And so we can't ignore ideas and that's why the lord jesus addressed the issue of ideas and if we are going to be effective in the marketplace we need to be able to deal with ideas and how do we deal with them walt disney on the positive side you've got guys like walt disney who came up with you know these ideas of um 
you know, a cat and a dog that talks to each other and, you know, and he started creating, uh, you know, stories around the cat and the dog. Uh, in, in African culture, I think we've experienced that as well, where we, we talk about Suro and Gudo, you know, the baboon and the hare and all these, uh, you know, folklore stories. But we never took our ideas to the level that, uh, uh, you know, Walt Disney did. And Walt Disney has created a multi-billion, in fact, I should say, you know, multi-trillion industry just from ideas that were coming out of his head. Uh, and so when we look at the different things that are taking place in the marketplace, we can't ignore ideas. And, um, you know, from a spiritual point of view, just like ideas are not physical, God is not physical. We don't, you know, people will... Uh, you know, talk about God and say, oh, some people will say he doesn't exist, others, because they can't see him. But we know that he's real. We know that he's powerful. We know that he's, uh, the, the, you know, he's got the power to change the things that are around us. The second thing that is there, amongst all the other things, is, of course, philosophies. You, you know how the world has been changed by philosophers. Uh, and philosophies reign in the marketplace today. You know, in, in the time of Jesus, there's Stoicism, Epicureanism, you, did, you had the uh, uh, Gnostics, you had the Hedonism, Mar today we have Marxism, we've got Leninism, we've got Tianism, we've got all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, philosophies that exist. And we know that uh, the man who controls the definition of a thing controls the conversation. And the world um, was defined on the basis of the philosophies that prevailing philosophies and the dominant philosophies. We know that during the time, uh, you know, when, um, uh, you know, the, 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 in Acts, when the disciples started going out, when the apostles started going out, one of the challenges that they were facing were the philosophies that were there dealing with the Greeks. You had to be a philosopher. You had to be somebody who understood, uh, you know, how things, you know, were taking place. You had to be a thinker, and you had to be a disciple of a particular person. That, you know, uh, you know, your Socrates, your Plato's, your Aristotle's. All of those guys influenced the way that things. Things, things took place. And today, what are the prevailing philosophies in the environment that we, we operate in? Remember, uh, you know, as, as Christianity evolved, there are guys who are saying, you can't be a Christian unless you've gone through Judaism first. You've got to understand the Torah. You've got to understand, you, you've got to be circumcised. And it became a big issue in the church, and it affected the way the church was operating at that time. It affected who could come into, into ministry, who could be, become a Christian, who could be born again. And thank God for the Holy Spirit and the way that he impacted and changed the way things operate. But today, I want to ask, what philosophies are there prevailing philosophies that affect the way we operate in the marketplace, that affect the way we see God, that affect the way we understand how, uh, you, know, you know, God wants us to expand his ministry. So, so philosophies, those philosophies, and, and if you look at the book of Colossians, it was dedicated to just dealing with, it says no more philosophies, because people were saying, Be, understand philosophy first, so you can understand you know, uh, Christianity. Uh, the Stoics were saying, you know, you know understand it from a, a Stoic point of view. The Epicureans also wanted to start with their, with, with, with their philosophy and then bring you into, into Christianity. Uh, we have that happening today in the church today, where different ministries and different ministers, uh, different men of God, uh, advance certain theories or philosophies about how things must happen before you can really uh, be, 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 be a Christian. They, they give philosophies and, 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 and they define certain things before you can be healed. You know, um, you know, if you want to be healed, please start off by going to healing school. If you want to do this, so, so there are rules 
and regulations, their do's and don'ts uh, in how you approach the gospel. And, and, you know, we can't ignore that. We've got to be able to understand and, and deal with it. And of course, you know, culture is, is very important. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, you know whether it's our languages, ideas, beliefs, customs, codes, institutions, techniques. You know, all those are very important. You, if you remember, in Acts 16, uh, verse 20 to 24, it says, um, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful to us, being Romans, to receive or to observe. They are teaching customs that are not lawful for us to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up against uh, them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison. Okay? So, so... Just, just trying to change cultural dynamics uh, can can lead to death. We know that right now, what happens between Arab nations and the West is a clash of cultures. Uh, uh, you know, Boko Haram is resisting uh, Western culture. Uh, you know, ISIS is resisting the way the, the West operates. In in in, in you know. Uh, it's a clash of cultures, and we've got wars that are taking place because of a clash of cultures. And the issue is, again, as believers, as people that are participating in the marketplace, are we just going there and say, give me Jesus? That's all I want to know. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You know, or we are seeking to understand. And I think the Lord showed us exactly how to engage the marketplace. And... Um, and how to deal with, with those matters. And I want to touch on that today. So when these ideas, philosophies, cultures, drivers of change, um, you, 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 uh, when, when the ideas, philosophies, and cultures combine with drivers of change to influence activities in the marketplace, you've got these paradigms that begin to emerge, paradigms that are established. And um, some of them are positive, others are negative. And uh, we need to be able to address them and, and, and see how we change them. And that is part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. That's, you know, what, you know, he, he approached the market in a way that made it, um, you know, uh, it's astounding, actually, when you look at it. And a lot of people did not receive him because for them, the Messiah was supposed to come, uh, uh, you know, to take a physical kingdom. But this Messiah was dealing with ideas. This Messiah was dealing with cultures. This Messiah was dealing with philosophies. This Messiah was dealing with, uh, you know, the way people live. This Messiah did not spend as much time in the uh, 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 you know in the synagogue as they would want they want him to he spent so much time in the marketplace uh, why was he so much in the marketplace and not you know going to fight the romans and that's part of what we want to to deal with so the the, the marketplace ministry the this work that uh, every single one of us here is doing uh, the objectives that have been outlined by Brother Farai earlier on, uh, the, the the objectives of the you know with um, you know um, this immense ministry is to equip us to be able to go in and engage with all the dynamics of the marketplace, including identity you know dealing with ideas, dealing with philosophies, dealing with um, uh, you know cultures. You know, on one of the groups on the forum. Uh, the, on the forum connect groups, you know, we, uh, you know, there are raging debates that take place there about different things. And it's been very important. You know, for instance, uh, I found that in the body of Christ, uh, we have got different views about, uh, you know, the biblical significance of Israel. 
or the significance of Israel, whether you look at it from a, a biblical perspective or the geopolitical perspective or, you know, any other way that you look at it. You know, so, so the Christians who say, you know, Israel is not, you know, the, the Israel that we see today is not the Israel that was defined in the Bible. This is a, a completely different Israel. So um, in saying that, are the prophecies that are given in the Bible still holding or are they not holding? But those are debates that you've got to, 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 to have in order to understand what is going on uh, today within the, uh, the Middle East. We have had, you know, um, debates uh, taking place about um, uh, leadership. You know, um, you know, uh, you know. For a long time, we we had a situation where when you're talking about Joseph, uh, we look at the leadership qualities of Joseph. We look at the journey of Joseph. We look at the sacrifices that you know uh, Joseph. Uh, uh, you know this personality, his character, we look at what his brothers did, and we're analyzing it from a leadership perspective and say, you know, how can we apply it in today's, um, uh, you know, in today's world? And, and of course, one of the prevailing things is that we've always looked at the Pharaoh as a bad guy, you know, you know look at what the Pharaohs did. But, you know, in one of the debates, we're, we're just talking about the Pharaoh who uh, released Joseph from prison and the decisions that he took, the decisions that he took for his country to deal with an impending disaster that was coming through, the decisions that he took as a man who did not believe uh, in God, but how he discerned uh, the presence of God on, 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 uh, uh, you know, on Joseph and how he made a decision that could never be made by any president today to appoint a prime minister who was 30 years old from a, another nation only so that you'd preserve the integrity and the future of your own nation, of the empire, that, you know, of the superpower that, that Egypt was. So, so, so the, 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 there's so many debates that take place which require us to think through and see things from a biblical perspective, but applying them and projecting them into what happens in the marketplace. And we have a role because, um, as I said you know, in, in, you know, in an earlier slide, we are the ones who are dealing with government ministers. We are the ones that are dealing with inflation. We are the ones that are dealing with uh, you know, these geopolitical wars. Uh, it's in the marketplace that you know certain ideas are coming through uh, you know where you know um you know narratives that go contrary to the word of god are taking place uh, so so we've got to engage that we are the ones that are either paying bribes or receiving bribes and how do we change that narrative if you know as as, as we work with christ and we and the point i'm making is that the marketplace begins to take a completely different uh, view. So there's business, yes, that is taking place in the marketplace, but there are things that affect our lives on a daily basis that require people like you and me to, to go out there and begin to influence what is taking place in the marketplace. So the marketplace is important because that's where you know, uh, that's, that, that, that's, that's where church actually happens. Now, if you go into Acts, you know, people started meeting in homes. People were meeting in homes. The church was about the activity of God's people within homes and within communities. Yes, people would go to the synagogue, but it was about what people were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It was about going into uh, uh, Peter's home and, and, and his mother-in-law is not, is not well. She was not at the synagogue. She was at, in the marketplace. It is, um, you know, the woman caught in adultery was not in the synagogue. That woman was in the marketplace. And the transformation that took place with her was taking place 
in the marketplace. It was, uh, you, you know, the guy who had been, uh, who had infirmity for 38 years and who couldn't move for 38 years was not in the synagogue. That guy was in the marketplace and that's where Jesus met him. So, so, so you then see that our role begins to, uh, you, you know, God is challenging us to extend what we know uh, and uh, or to bring church into the marketplace. That's that's what God wants us to do. And and I think I've shared this this before that almost all non-Christians are in the marketplace. That is that is all all non-Christians are in the marketplace. Okay, um, you know I I went to um, India once. Um, and I was in the, I think I was staying in the, uh, in the Hyatt Hotel. And in there, I saw something that I wanted to buy. And, but the owner was not there. So I waited for him. I went back. I think I must have gone four times. And on the fourth time, he comes in holding a pail. Um, you know, those buckets and the, the mat. And I knew immediately that he was uh, a, a Muslim and so we greeted each other and i said you know i wanted to buy you know i think it was leather jackets i says oh yeah, yeah and i can uh, i can do which one do you want and i say to him if i uh buy four because i've got four girls would you um would you pray to my god <laughs> the guy went ballistic he really went ballistic. He says, you know, you know, I'm Muslim. I pray five times a day. You do this. And, I, and he was so upset. I, for a moment, I thought he was going to kick me out of his shop. And at that point, and, and I was regretting, I was really feeling bad because, you know, I've worked in those environments. I've worked, you know, in environments where, you know, you've got maybe 30, 40 percent of your staff are Muslim. And, and, you know, uh, respect for one another and coexistence becomes very important whilst, you know, maintaining your own values. Um, and so I, I, I felt like maybe I, I was just insensitive. At that point, I wasn't singing uh, worship music. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing... At that moment, the Holy Spirit said to me, Ask him about his two-year-old daughter. And his voice was so clear, I actually got startled a little bit. And I, I, I needed to look at the, at the, at the guy. And, and you know, when it is so unexpected, I looked at him, I said, uh, how's your two-year-old daughter? And he looked at me and he said, how do you know about my, my, my daughter? told you about my daughter? Who, who are you? How do you know? And I said, I told you about my God. Uh, the spirit of my God told me that you have got a two-year-old daughter. And at that point in time, you know, you know, he, he just froze. And the Holy Spirit continued and said, concerning his business, tell him this and that and that and that and that. And this is, I mean, it, it, it was incredible. And I just started laying out and explaining to him. And in a moment, okay, he, I saw him get on the phone. Then, you know, like 10, 15 minutes later, his wife arrives with their two-year-old daughter. This is my two-year-old daughter. This is, you know, and the wife is saying, what is, what is the Jesus telling you about me? And so I said, look, guys, um, I can, I'd like to pray for you. He says, pray for me. Pray for us. And the husband immediately went on his knees and lifted his hands up. And the wife, the same. And they lifted their hands up. And they said, um, pray for us. I said, I can only pray for you in the name of Jesus. He said, pray for us in the name of Jesus. So, so you, you see, these are the things, these are the interactions that God wants us to have in the marketplace. This is not about... Uh, my pastor, let me go and call my pastor so that my pastor can come and do this. This is a business environment where we, as um, you know, marketplace uh, players, begin to advance the kingdom of God seamlessly. 
So yes, I was at church on Sunday. Yes, today is 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 is, is Thursday. But you know what? The kingdom of God car- carries on just like that today, right now. Uh, you know, so many interactions that we've had. I don't know the the number of Muslims that I've led to the Lord. It has never been because I was at church or they had come to church. It was because we're meeting in the marketplace. Uh, you, you see, almost all Christians are also in the marketplace. You know, um, I was in a hospital uh, two months ago, and this lady came to, to deliver food. And as she, as she came in, the Holy Spirit said, tell her that contrary to what you think, you're blessed. So there I am with lots of drugs in my head, and I just said, the Lord is telling me to tell you that you are blessed. You are blessed. She put the tray down, and she started weeping. And, and because that day she was praying, and she said, Lord, you know, I, I just feel that I'm cursed. And the Lord was answering it directly. I didn't know what, what I was saying. I just obeyed. I just said what I was saying. And um, from there, you know, it was, it was all sorts of, of things. So discipleship must happen in the marketplace. I remember, you know, I was um, at one of my friend's offices, you know, in the boardroom. I was waiting for the meeting. And they, you know, they sent a lady to come and um, deliver coffee to me. And when she came in, uh, you know, I said, how are you doing? And the lady said, ah, it's tough. And I said, uh, can, I, can you pray with me? I said, Lord, say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, etc." I didn't preach to her. I didn't talk to her about Jesus. I, didn't talk, I just started by speaking. You know, I just, I just said, you know, uh, I, I led it to the Lord, just like that. And she broke down. She started weeping and, you know, and then she stood up and she said, you know what? I feel a weight has been removed from me. I feel things have happened that I've not, you know, imagined before. So, so this is what God is looking at, where we take the church into the marketplace. I could tell stories and stories. This is where, you know, this is where we display the, the the you know uh, uh, church this is where we display christianity the, you know the marketplace forces the church to use all its capabilities because you've got people that are sick you've got people that you, you know are rich you've got people that are poor you've got people that are lame you've got people this is it all happens in the marketplace and so the ministry this particular ministry is so crucial it has a role that is just as impactful as any denomination or church ministry that is out there. Good things happen in the marketplace. Bad things happen in the marketplace. The church is funded from the marketplace. And, I, you, know, you know, Jesus' 132 public appearances, 122 were in the marketplace. His parables where of the 52 parables that are recorded, 45, uh, you, you know, at a work, workplace, you know, context. The 40 divine interventions recorded in Acts 39 happened in the marketplace. Jesus spent 50% of his life as a carpenter. That's in the marketplace. The disciples were called from the marketplace. And, 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 and we, we go on. You know, uh, uh, remember the industrial, uh, I mean, the, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. They say they needed to deal with things that were in the marketplace that had to be addressed. If there was going to be change, if the nation was going to be changed, of course, it was a disastrous all. Uh, but uh, Mao Zedong uh, talked about the four olds that needed to be addressed, old customs, old cultures, old habits, and old ideas. So, so the, it has always been known that the things that hold us back are those things, customs and cultures and so forth. The Lord Jesus said, you make the word of God of no effect because of your traditions. Now, 
So, so, so Jesus would bring stories, signs and wonders. He created an organizational structure that continues to grow today, that continues to expand today uh, faster than any other organization. He was disrupting, he was creating all sorts of challenges, forcing people to rethink because he knew that the marketplace could not just be about people who have gone to church. Now, let me just talk about a few. I'll give an example of a few uh, paradigms that Jesus you know, began to deal with, which are things that are topical today. You know, um, they say at the moment that Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. If you talk to, uh, you know, I, I interact with a lot of um, uh, you know, Messianic Jews and, uh, and, and uh, traditional Jews and you know, Orthodox Jews, etc. Orthodox Jews are saying right now that you know, they believe that Netanyahu is the one that is going to usher in, he's going to announce the Messiah anytime now. The war that is taking place right now, the Messiah is about to come so that he take, takes over. But it is a, a, a debate that goes on uh, in the marketplace which has got significant impact for all of us. And um, so, so, so John 1 verse 11, uh, you, you know, in, in, in the book of John, God, the Holy Spirit, addresses that issue. That Jesus was not uh, just for the Jews. Because it says that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. And then, uh, you know, John, John, John 1, 12 to 13, but as many as uh, received him, he gave the power to be called the sons of God. I've seen, you know, arguments by guys like Joshua Maponga, he's going everywhere on the, uh, you know, and many others who are trying to say that the, the gospel is not for, for, for Africans that, you know, there must be African religions. There are some people who are saying, no, the gospel is for white people. But Jesus says, no. You, you know, the Holy Spirit he told us here that, you know, he came for his own. His own did not receive him. In other words, the Jews did not receive him. But as many as received him, whether you were Greek, whether you were African, you were, you know, from Arabia or wherever, American, Chinese, as many as received them, he gave the right to be called the children of God. So, so just by that, there is a paradigm that has been shaped. It's there, it's written, it exists. It's the same thing, you know, many years ago, people say that the earth was flat. But if you go into the Bible, the Bible was already saying that the earth is round. He drew, where were you when he drew the circle of the earth? All there. You know, when Christians started, you know, when the disciples started moving, you know, uh, dispersing and going into, you know, uh, uh, there, was, there was a big issue that, you know, Judaism, 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 you know, you've got to be converted to Judaism in order to understand the Torah. You've got to be converted to Judaism to do this and that. But uh, when Jesus does his first miracle at Canaan, Jesus comes in and he says, um, he, he, you know, the debate has always been, why did he turn water into wine? Jesus was dealing with customs, old customs, you know, the, 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 in the manner of uh, the, uh, you know, purification of the Jews. So there were those jars. The, you know, there was a, a, a leader, the, the wedding uh, the, 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 you know, the uh, master of ceremonies. There's, it was a traditional thing. And Jesus was saying, you know, your religion is just an ordinary, an ordinary function. It's just an ordinary ritual. You know, it's just like a wedding that has always existed. But now, here I have come. You know, things have to change. So Jesus creates a new wine. He says, you know, the church cannot continue. The kingdom of God cannot be, cannot continue to exist in the manner that is there of traditional Jewish uh, uh, functions. There, there's got to be new wine. And so he created new wine. 
And the leaders, the people that were in charge of that, did not know what happened. The master of ceremonies did not know where it came from because Jesus was introducing a new wine. And the people that knew were the servants, not the, not the, not the, 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 the owners of the function. And today, this is what the ministry is all about, that uh, the ordinary people like you and me are the ones that are going on. It's not, it's not the uh, religious structures that have been created. It's, it's God wants us to go out there. God wants to use ordinary people to bring you wine. The, you, you have in John 2, you know, guys were, you know, uh, the temple became a place everyone was focusing on sacrifices. So, so the sacrifices became very, very important. You know, you've got to sacrifice. So you bring cows, you bring this, and now, okay, you can't drive cows from uh, 500 kilometers away. Just come in. You will buy cows at the market, at the church, at the temple. You will buy the goats and sheep and whatever you want. You buy the birds that you want. And, and, you know, you, you find them there at the temple. There, you know, people who sell doves, people who sell cows, who sell, money changes, everyone. And Jesus is the only person He's the only one who came in and re-established. He said, you see, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Today, right now, today, there is more talk about money in the church. More talk about money in the church. And we, as business people, are actually participating in all that. There's nothing wrong with extending the kingdom of God, but there is something wrong in believing that you can go and give a car. When you've given a car to the church, then you believe that you will get 10 cars. That if you, if you go and you, you, you give this little thing to the church, you get that. And Jesus was just smashing it. He says, you know what? Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Jeremiah could not have said my father's house. You know, um, Isaiah would not have been able to say my father's house. Jesus was establishing that I am God. I'm the son of God. And this is my father's house. You know, it's a house of prayer. And you're making a den of thieves. And, and he goes on. We, we, we see in ministry today, and, and this is a very important point, uh, you know, that I want to close with as we talk about um, you know, the shifting of these paradigms within the kingdom of God. You see, uh, we've always, uh, you know, there's this man of God syndrome. Yesterday I was shouting at somebody because, the, you know, the little child was being given some stuff, you know, toxic stuff, for which they had to go and be, uh, you know, um, the child had to be hospitalized twice because the man of God had prayed for this and the child must eat this. And the child, and I said, this is nonsense. And I want to see that man of God. Okay? So, you know, how can you give things that are toxic? People are eating snakes. People are drinking petrol. People are doing this because the man of God said. Yet, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, he, you know, the kingdom of God, he changed everything. Do you remember? You know, in Luke 8, Luke 8 says that, uh, you know, there were women who served Jesus. Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been taken out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. Susanna, the, you know, uh, there was a lady called Susanna and many others. These funded the ministry. These are people who were broken. These are people who were... Uh, you know, uh, you know, we're not. We, we don't even know who Susanna was. We don't have any detail about her. But she was with Jesus faithfully, and Jesus, you know, used these same people. Mary Magdalene became the first woman to see, the person who had seven demons was the first one to see the risen Christ. We see, you know, guys like Nicodemus. Nicodemus, yes, he came to Jesus by night. He was a teacher of the law. And Jesus was saying, you, you know, you've, you've been running the ministry. You've been running this. How, how can you not know? 
that unless you are born again, and he, he began to explain to him what it means to be born again. And he says something that is truly powerful in the, uh, you know, in, in, in John 3, um, you know, John 3, 14. It says, just like Moses lifted up uh, the, the serpent in the desert, so must the, so must the Son of God be lifted up so that whoever looks at him, whoever believes in him shall be saved. And he was talking about what happened in, uh, in, in, in uh, Numbers 21, when the children of Israel rebelled against, uh, you know, against, um, uh, against God and serpents were coming and biting them. And, and you only needed to look to Christ, to, to, to look the serpent, and people would be healed. And Jesus is saying, you know, uh, you only look, need to look to the cross. You know, as it's explained in 1 Corinthians, that I determined to know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. You just need to look to the cross and you'll be saved. You don't need to go to this deliverance and that deliverance and to do this and to do that, to go through all the rituals. Those are the rituals that Jesus was smashing. You need to believe in the cross. You need to see Jesus and believe that he died on the cross and that he rose on the third day. And, and so broken people, Nicodemus, and when, when Jesus dies, Nicodemus is one of the guys with uh, Joseph of Arimathea who go to take the body of Christ. There must have been people of influence to be allowed to go before uh, 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 Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus Christ, like going to the president and say, can I have the body of this uh, you know, hero, you know, national hero, the guy that you have declared national hero, give me his body so I can go and bury it myself. That's the kind of influence that you and I have, you and I should have in the marketplace. Luke, the doctor, Lydia was a, a lady who sold purple and she had so much influence. She was funding the ministry and she was going on the ministry. Zacchaeus, is the tax collector. You know, uh, the Roman, um, you know, the, 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 Roman, um, the, the Roman centurion who believed, you know, uh, so, so we, we have a situation where uh, in the kingdom of God, we need to start looking at things differently to begin to understand that you and me as believers in Jesus Christ have the power and the ability and have been anointed by the Lord uh, and are being challenged by the Lord today to start moving, to start going into the marketplace and to, be, and to begin to, to do things in the marketplace that we would, we've traditionally said, oh no, these things can only be done by pastor so-and-so. These things can only be done by apostle so-and-so. These things can only be done by prophet so-and-so. God wants to use us, you and me, in the marketplace ministry to begin to shape things, to begin to change things. And, and, and that's, that's, you know, when I was just talking about shifting existing paradigms i'm talking to you and to me to say how do we stop walking through or following existing ways that the church has been conducted and begin to understand that with where you are right now god wants to use you to change the marketplace and this is not just about uh, you know, uh, the business that you are doing in the marketplace, the trading that you're doing in the marketplace. But God wants you, when you are in the marketplace, to heal the sick. God wants you, when you are in the marketplace, to, 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 to discharge uh, the, the uh, commandment, to get the things that he wants done in the marketplace done. Whether it's healing somebody, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, making somebody understand something, whether it's changing the way that uh, the minister, you know, like a, a Nicodemus, changing Nicodemus so that by the end of the day, he's now a disciple. That is what God is looking for. And I just want to say, God has uh, blessed this ministry. God has blessed every single one of you with an opportunity to go out and change South Africa to go and change Zimbabwe, to go and change Nigeria, to go and change 
you know, different markets and communities that we have. Because with where we are, uh, with the Holy Spirit in us, we've got all tools that are needed for life and godliness and to be able to change the things that God has commanded us to change. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Apostle. So, 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 so the, the call to action is be part of uh, Acts 29. Acts, uh, you know, uh, Acts ends at uh, Acts 28. We have to be part of Acts 29. We have to be Acts 29. We have to be the disciples that are going out and changing markets. We have to be the disciples that are going before the kings, King Agrippa and whoever. We are the ones that should be appealing to Caesar. We are the people that should be changing, turning the world upside down. And that's our call to action. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Apostle. Uh, for this very powerful teaching. Um, at this point in time, I'll just encourage men, please be posting any questions you have uh, for Apostle as we go into the question and answer segment. Um, but I think I'll kick us off with uh, two questions that I had myself, Apostle, um, as you went in. Um, I think the first one was on cultural impact, uh, when you're talking about cultural impact. Um, and you mentioned Acts 16 um, for Paul and Silas when they were arrested for uh, trying to deliver, or at least delivering the slave girl from demonic possession. Um, and you're basically talking about changing cultures, how changing cultures can lead to death. Um, so from, from an application perspective, how do we practically integrate faith and business without crossing boundaries of ethics um, within a diverse work environment, right? So if I give an example, as you mentioned, in your presentation that, you know, um, we see in the marketplace that communities such as the LGBTQT community, um, it's very easy for them to have presence um, and even committees, you know, within the marketplace that are accepted by business and are assimilated, right? But the moment we want to um, bring about Christianity in the same dynamic, you know, um, it can lead to, um, death, if I can say, in a, in a modern sense, you know, it can lead to ostracization or it can, it, it's almost like this red flag, you know, you know, the flags go off um, as soon as we want to uh, impose Christian ethics, you know, in our various committees. So uh, it's just to say, how do we navigate that environment, you know, to, um, where persecution might, might, might come up in that sense? And then the second question I had was uh, measuring success from a marketplace ministry perspective is to say, how do we measure our success through marketplace ministry? Is it through business outcomes? Is it through socioeconomic uh, metrics? Is it through personal development, how we're developing people? Um, so just, those are just my two questions for you before we go into the other questions. Okay, okay. let me just address them. I'll, I'll, I'll address the sensitive one that you mentioned last. You know, how do we navigate that through the market? It's, but uh, there are certain, certain decisions that we have to make that change, um, you know, that, that will change traditions. Because Jesus said, you make the word of God of no effect because of your traditions, okay? So um, uh, Brother Sam did something a couple of months ago, um, and I was, I was blessed to be, you know, one of the witnesses when he, went there and to, to his, uh, you know, to his parents-in-law and he said, look, uh, I'm so happy with my wife and with the way that you have raised her and the way that we have lived, that I'd like to pay some more lobola. And his father-in-law said, even in the Bible, there is no way else that it has ever been done. This thing has never been done. Now, that's the beginning. That's how we change cultures. That's how we change uh, thinking, philosophies, because it, it's never heard. And, and it was quite interesting. I was just sitting there and observing. Under normal circumstances, you've got a, mid, you know, a, a guy, uh, the Munyai, you know, who comes in and say, you know, and he's uh, being told what um, the bride price is. But in this particular case, uh, 
his own uh, representative right was saying right for for this we want to pay so much you know and, and turn it around okay and it was it was incredible people were touched people were changed that's how we do it in my in my in my village i've gone in there and i've said oh okay so there are these uh, things these um things that are done every you know when a person is dead 12 months later you must go and bring his spirit back into the and I, and, I, and i went in there and i said uh, this doesn't make sense because of the following and we went through and it has been banned well we don't we don't practice that anymore anyone who does that in our village does it without they do it quietly okay because we 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 have uh, we we have um, you know, we, we've got to have that boldness uh, to, to go and advocate and speak about our belief and why we believe in what we believe, okay? Uh, just recently, one of my uncles was a spirit medium and the last of the generation of my fathers. You know, when he died, I addressed 250 Wazaras and I said, you know what? Today marks the end of spiritism spirit mediums and any form of direct or indirect ancestral worship in our village no one in no one speaks about it and and it was quite incredible the number of people that were contacting me and saying oh thank you you know we just sticked in tradition we thought that you couldn't challenge this thing so we have to to do that i've had situations you know where when i was working in nigeria i had staff members who were muslim and they used to you know during ramadan etc they needed places of worship yes and there i am as a christian um, and and i uh, i had to provide that space for them okay but you know what god is amazing because sometimes fundamentalism with the way we think it makes us believe that uh, you know, you just have to mama it and, and be radical. But look at the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he deal with the woman at the well? The woman at the well was a prostitute. Okay? And she was a Samaritan. And, she, you know, men did not speak with women. So for Jesus to be standing at the well with a prostitute, who was Samaritan, when Jews usually used to go around, that didn't make sense. But he used that opportunity to create something that will forever be remembered. See, inside the prostitute, and, 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 and I hope you understand what we are talking about, addressing your, your, your sensitive issue. Inside the prostitute was a couple of things. She said, uh, you are a Jew. Why are you speaking to a Samaritan? Okay? So she raised the issue of xenophobia and whatever, whatever. Okay? Then the next thing, she, she says, um, you, you know, this well was given by our father Abraham. Are you saying that you are greater than, uh, uh, than our father Jacob who dug this well, etc., etc.? So she, 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 she's saying, because she had discerned that this is this guy, this is something about this guy. So she, she, she starts trying to say something that would clean. The presence of Jesus alone was convicting her. And so she talks about Jacob. Then the next thing, she, uh, she says, you know, give me these living waters. You know, please give me these living waters. Says I, and, 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 and then Jesus says, go and call your husband. And she says, I discern you are a prophet. Now, look at the things that Jesus was growing out of her. And then she talks about worship. That, you know, our fathers told us that we must worship at this place. But you Jews say we must worship in Jerusalem. She's talking about worship. Now, this is a prostitute. There are four things or five things that Jesus extracts from the prostitute without saying to her, you are a prostitute. And then when she goes to call the, 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 the men, okay, they may have been her clients, and they come back, and, you know, and they say, he says, Look, come and see somebody who's told me everything that I've ever known. 
And they all come. And all of a sudden, the, the prostitute that day becomes an evangelist. She didn't go to, to Bible school. She didn't go. That day, the prostitute became an evangelist. The whole city came. And they said, now we believe, not because of what you told us, but because we have had. And I, I just want to say to us, and it's a very, very important question. We need to be, to use the wisdom of God. We need to use the power of the Holy Spirit in dealing with the most of, uh, if, if you look at, um, uh, at an LGBTQ person as, um, as an enemy, just like you could look at the Muslim as an enemy, then you are already starting on this wrong foot. You are being like uh, John and them when they said they call us to go to Samaria and they refuse to go into Samaria and they said, you know, they, they, these guys are resisting us. Shall we call fire from heaven in order to destroy this? And Jesus said, you don't know what man of spirit you're speaking from. I came to save lives, not to destroy them. So I just want to say, uh, if we look at the Lord Jesus, the way the adulterous woman in John 8, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, every single person that he dealt with had things that were negative. But he had a way of extracting the truth of God out of them until they believed. So what, how have you been equipped to, to do that? Is that a question for me? <laughs> It's a question for all of us because it's a question that I ask myself every single time. When I feel a prejudice is coming in, I say to myself, Lord, how would you deal with this? And that's where the Holy Spirit comes through. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Apostle. That's a very, very powerful answer and very, very practical. Um, I'll now go into the questions and comments being posted on the chat. So we'll start off with Brother Blessing, who's saying, Powerful presentation, Mkumazak. Are uh, we therefore concluding that the marketplace serves as a platform for ministering the gospel, going beyond mere business returns and focusing on eternal impact? So that's a question. Yes, uh, this is the biggest platform that is there. Because uh, in my church, I might have 300 people, I might have 1,000 people and think that this is exciting. But you know the marketplace is 7 billion people. So how do we use that platform to advance the kingdom of God? If Jesus had restricted himself to the synagogue, most probably the church today would be uh, a very, very small. His church would be very, very small. But he knew that the marketplace was where uh, you know, the, the, everything that is promised by the Spirit of God was needed. Okay? And, and I believe that, and I mentioned it earlier on, the totality of the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit are best, man, are best implemented and manifest in the marketplace. You know, uh, you're talking about these... Uh, you know, people that, you know, um, you know the, the, the LGBTQ, the Muslims. I, I've had situations where somebody like that comes through to me and they are arguing, hey, and I say, okay. And, and, and um, I've extended my hand to bless them. And the Holy Spirit has just immediately, you know, gone all over them and they, they're dazed and they want to know about Christ. But only in the marketplace. Amen. Amen. And then we, we go to the next questions from Brother Simukai, uh, who's asking, who's reciting, good presentation, Apostle Zach. How then do we transform churches to be institutions that capacitate men to go and influence the marketplace? What sort of preparation empowerment and action should churches do to enable men to be effective in the marketplace? And then uh, also combine that with a question from Brother Felix who's saying, thanks for the great message. The marketplace these days frowns at an outward display of religious activities, praying and preaching. How are there any recommendations on how we can manage that? Yes, so, so 
here, here is the, uh, you know, the, the, the way I look at it is that uh, I think there's a scripture that says that we must be ready to, uh, to, to, we must be ready to share the reason for the joy that we have inside of us. I think a lot of um, uh, us, and I, I've experienced it before, where I was uh, scared uh, to share the gospel because I thought that sharing the gospel was about going there and say, you know, Psalm 133 says this and this and that and that and that. But if you look again, just at the way Jesus approached it, that sometimes Jesus would go in there and say, a certain man, um, you, you know, uh, sold everything that he had. Um, you, you know, he saw a, a pearl of great price and sold everything that he had. He, he's, he didn't say, the Lord, the Father God, sent his son and did this. He would tell a story, tell a parable, in a manner that when a person started thinking, they suddenly realized that, wow, this is incredible. Uh, I've got, um, um, I think in 2018, I was, in, um, I was asked to speak at a church in Nigeria. As soon as I finished, uh, in the pastor's lounge, the pastor said to me, look, we, we have a member of the church who is, uh, who is actually busy preparing his, um, he, you know, putting his things in order because he has said that he wants to commit suicide. So everyone knows that he wants to commit suicide. His family knows that he wants to commit suicide, etc. Can you please pray with him? And, um, you know, I said, okay. Now, how do you approach that kind of thing, okay? And I, um, so I invited the guy for breakfast. I said, can you come and have breakfast with me, please? So he came, and, and I said, you know, I just want to tell you, we, we started talking about Africa, we started talking about some of the things that I've gone through, you know, um, you know, uh, how we set up in Botswana, how I was arrested. I was, we talked about different things that, um, you know, different things about life and, and my own experiences and testimonies, etc. When we finished um, breakfast, I said, thank you so much for coming to see me. I'm so happy that we got to meet. Okay. I never preached a word. I never spoke a word to him. As we were leaving the, you know, getting into the foyer of the hotel, said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you have just told me not to commit suicide. I said, did you want to commit suicide? I, I didn't know you wanted to commit suicide. He says, yeah, everything that you have told me has answered the things that I said, uh, the reasons why I wanted to kill myself. I said, well, that's incredible to know that, you know, everything has been addressed. He's there today, okay? Uh, sometimes it's not about the scriptures that we are pouring out. It's about the life that we share. It's about the wisdom of God that we share. It's about the presence of the Holy Spirit that we are allowed to be released. Because at the end of the day, in such situations, it's the Holy Spirit who is doing what he needs to do. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And then we'll just go to a few comments. So we have a comment from the chairman saying amen and amen. Uh, we have a comment from Brother Chris who's saying awesome presentation, Apostle. Thank you. We have a comment from Brother Kudai who's saying thank you for the insightful presentation. This speaks to the transition series we're currently on. And then we also have a comment from Brother Kennedy who's saying thank you for a powerful presentation. Yes, indeed, even today in some churches, women are still providers for Christ's ministry as it was during the Jesus' ministry. Uh, and then I'll go into two questions from uh, both Brother Taff and Brother Inais. So Brother Taff is asking uh, or saying, thank you for a great message. Exodus 25 verse 8 tells us and tells us, and let them make me a sanctuary that I, I may dwell among them. 
We see the presentation and planning that went into building the Old Testament temple by the various kings and prophets. How do we relate that to modern day circumstances? And then um, we go to a question from Brother Nice who's asking, uh, thank you for the practical message that speaks to how we should conduct ourselves in the marketplace. The call to remain authentic as unique Christians. How should Christians deal with unethical practices in the business marketplace? Things like kickbacks, palm greasing, and working with the corrupt business people. So I think the first question is just speaking to um, applying Old Testament principles to the modern day uh, in the context of building the temple. And then the second has to do with kickbacks, uh, corruption, and so forth. Yes, so so the, the the with regards to the temple, and and, and it's, it's a great question, because that's actually what Jesus was addressing, and and uh, when he said, you know, uh, you know, build this temple, and in three days, you know, um, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. Now, for the Jew, destroying the temple, you know, everything that they did was about building the temple. And, and, and they believed that, uh, you know, worship could only take place in the temple. That was the holy place. And Jesus comes and says, you know, um, you know, worship is no longer going to be, you know, in fact, when he speaks to the woman at the well, he says those, those that worship, the, you know, Jesus will, the, the, those that worship the Lord will worship in spirit and in truth. And, and so he shifted everything from the temple itself and started talking about the kingdom of God. And he says that the kingdom of God does not come by observation. You don't say, there it is, here it is. The kingdom of God lives inside of you. And that is why, you know, when, you know, um, when, when, when Jesus was talking to, uh, in Matthew 11, 11, that the kingdom of God suffers violence and violent men take it by force. We, normally, the attacks that we see on, on, us, on ourselves, our people are attacking the temple because the kingdom of God lives inside of us. And so it's no longer about building the temple out there. It's about upholding the kingdom of God. And we are the repository of the kingdom of God as long as we are moving around, you know, we are advancing the word of God, you know, from that perspective. So that's a huge paradigm. Where is the temple? The temple is here. Where is the synagogue? It's it's the kingdom of God. Jesus came to establish his his kingdom. Now uh, the, the question from uh, Brother Enias, you know, uh, sometime you know we'll, we'll talk about it maybe in. Uh, but I've had you know practical uh, situations where we um, in the different countries that we worked, uh, we were asked for bribes. Um, we asked for bribes in our, the first network that we established. We asked for bribes in the second network. We asked for bribes uh, in East Africa. And in fact, a, you know, um, leading to a, a couple of things. I, 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 I got arrested a couple of times in part of the, um, um, you know, the, the fights that were taking place. Um, I've been expelled from certain countries a couple of times and uh, I actually have a, a, a prohibited immigrant letter in one of the countries because we refused to pay a bribe. Um, but most importantly, we actually lost, you know, we lost Botswana for five years. Uh, we lost Nigeria for 10 years. We lost, um, you know, quite a number of countries because we would not pay a cent. Now, when I tell people that we were in Nigeria for, we operated in Nigeria for, uh, for, for three years, the first three years, and we did not pay a single cent. You know, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we're not telling the truth, but uh, we actually did. But the consequences of taking that is what most believers do not want to go through. So we, we, we lost a, a $4 billion company because we would not pay a bribe in another country, we lost, you know, a $130 million company at that time because we're not willing to pay a bribe. Uh, you know, people know some of the things that took place in Zimbabwe, uh, you know, for, for quite a number of years. And um, 
there is pain associated with it. But the message, because the time is gone, the message that I want to uh, leave with you is that um, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you must know that all things belong to him. So if somebody comes through and demands a bribe, the Bible says bribes will blind you. Um, you, you know, so, so we made a decision that I've got my business plan, my corporate business plan, and there's God's business plan. And if it is about paying a bribe so that my business plan may be advanced, I'd rather let it go so that God's business plan can advance. And I know, if you read Luke 5, that when Peter allowed the Lord to use his business for his business, um, they caught so much fish that, you know, he had to call his business partners to help him. And when they got to shore, he realized that he didn't even need to carry on with business. He just followed Jesus. We must hold on to God's business plan. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Apostle, for that. And then we'll go to the last comment from uh, Brother Hubert, who's saying this is an integral part of theological study and research. So just encapsulating everything that you've, you've touched on. Um, I think I'll also if you can clarify to know. I think this question is maybe um, to be addressed. I don't know if you want to address it now or, as you said, later in your in your um, next chat. He says that uh, this is Brother No More. Pastor, if you can clarify to us uh, how they term it, this bribe. Is it is it the same they call facilitation fees? I have noticed they address it with good names. So I think he's just saying, um, can you clarify, you know, how bribes come in? Um, some call it facilitation fees, consultancy fees, um, transaction fees, you know, so I think maybe he's just asking to shed light on that. Yes, so, 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 uh, so sometimes as Christians we try to blur the, uh, the, the edges. Um, the, if for those that are in trading, you all know, uh, you get commissions for participating in a transaction and different commissions for different people. If you are an introducer, you get one sort of fee. If you are uh, uh, you know, a transaction arranger, you get this. If you are this, you, you get a commission for the work that you have done, okay? But a bribe is where you are told, my friend, for you to get this thing, give me this amount, and it's not visible. It's done clandestinely. Uh, and um, you know that if it is found out that you paid that amount, there will be a crisis, commercial, uh, moral, and other crisis. So, so the, the bribe is very clear. A bribe is something that is paid, uh, you know, outside of the normal transaction in order to uh, grease the hands, to persuade somebody to give you a contract that you don't qualify for, or to give you a contract that you should not be getting, etc. That is a bribe. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the clarity, Apostle. Um, and I guess at that point, um, we can now end the meeting now and just say thank you for, again, taking the time to share with us uh, this powerful message. Um, for all the men on the, on the chat, I have 